Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at this year's Venice Architecture Biennial. Organizers are greeting thousands of architecture enthusiasts after months of lockdown and travel restrictions. And this year, it examines the coexistence of architecture and the environment in the midst of global issues and, of course, the coronavirus pandemic. This year's Venice Architecture Biennale, one of the most prestigious events in the architecture world, is taking place right now until the end of November. Hashim Sarkis is the Dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning. He's also the curator of this year's event. Sarkis wanted architects to focus on the future and its many challenges, so he posed the question, how will we live together? There's no doubt that everybody will be looking at it through the eyes of their experience through the pandemic. There's no doubt that the questions of entrance and exit, the distancing, affect the attendance and all. But beyond that, when we had to postpone the Biennale because of the pandemic, I did ask the participants, how are you going to adjust? Are you going to adjust? Because let's think about it this way. The question, how will we live together, was asked because of climate change because of deep political polarization, because of issues of increasing inequalities across the globe. Hashim selected 112 participants from 46 countries after searching for those with the most creative and innovative solutions that would satisfy his question. Grenada, Iraq, Uzbekistan, and Azerbaijan are all participating for the first time and this year also sees solid delegations from Africa, Latin America, and Asia. The exhibition's 63 pavilions are arranged within five separate areas and are spread throughout Venice, including many in the city's historic city center. The projects include virtual maps, interactive machines, designs for poor neighborhoods, and even QR codes all offering better ways to help people live better together. Hospital of the Future, for example, is a direct response to the coronavirus pandemic. While claiming that the Western model may have reached the limits of the health system, it questions the role of health institutions. The need to rethink the notion of common good, including public health. That, I think, is a deep lesson that we have to learn from the pandemic. And architecture participates in shaping the public health because it shapes the public realm. City to Dust is another timely installation that people walk on and every step they take breaks the tiles on the floor. It aims to showcase how destructive extreme tourism has been for the city of Venice. With the architecture as measure project, the Turkish pavilion tries to answer how architecture can contribute to the environment in light of the current climate crisis beyond just depending on technology. Three British mosques display reproductions of three mosques created in a former church and former synagogue, a pub and a semi-detached house. It showcases how Muslim communities have been able to use different spaces to create unique places of worship. So there's a mosque which was established primarily by a Pakistani community, one was established by a Nigerian community and one by a Bangladeshi community. Um, and what it shows is the great diversity of, uh, of Muslim culture in Britain. Um, and then it shows how each of the different communities shape the spaces and adapt them and create them to form, to kind of realize their own aspirations. While some at the Biennale are trying to solve problems on planet Earth, Life Beyond the World features a village slated for creation on the moon, using advances in technology that, that exist or are still being developed. Its goal is to show that global cooperation between multiple countries and multiple partners is truly possible if everyone combines their expertise and works toward a common goal. I am an optimist by heart. Uh, the Biennale has been organized optimistically. 
around this question of how will we live together. Uh, and I think that what we would like to do with this particular portion of the exhibition is to show that it is possible to build a collaborative future. The curator of this year's Venice Architecture Biennale agrees with Coop's optimism about the future. Hashim Sarkis says he's done with envisioning dystopias, and he thinks that the city of the future will arise from the need to share common spaces, consume less, and create new forms of solidarity. Okay, let's bring in this year's curator. Uh, welcome, Hashim Sarkis, to Showcase. So, how will we live together is the question behind this year's edition. And in answering that, um, do you think the picture you're presenting in terms of diversity giving the right message? Because, I mean, let me just share some figures here. Uh, just 25% of the participants this year are women and only one third are from outside Europe and the US. I mean, is this a good way to live together, Hashem? Thank you for having me. Uh, the theme of this Biennale is a question. It's an open question. How will we live together? And indeed, the hope is that we do not get one answer, but we do get 115 answers. The idea was to look everywhere, not just in Europe, for answers to this question or in North America. And indeed, the more pressing problems and the more interesting answers are coming to us from uh, what initially would have been considered the margin, but I do not think anymore. As a curator who uh, comes not from the Western world, uh, at least by origin, as from Beirut, uh, I took it uh, to be my responsibility to be more inclusive and, as you mentioned, more diverse. The uh, numbers are different than perhaps what you mentioned, in the sense that if you count the architects who were invited to be participating in this Biennale, the, the firms that have principles who are either primarily women or one of the main principles are women count up to two thirds of the firms. And indeed, many of the firms may be based in Northern Europe or in the United States, but they have members of the firms who are from uh, Africa, from, uh, from Asia, from Latin America. So. Uh, in this very diverse world that we live in, in this world where we are all nomads and refugees, uh, the designation that they come from Italy or they come from the United States does not mean that they are Italian or American. Okay, Hashim, so uh, if I'm not mistaken, you think that you've done well in terms of diversity in this biennial? Uh, compared to previous biennials, yes, but mm -hmm. we can do much better in the future and we will have to continue to do better. In a profession where uh, perhaps only 20% are women, if you average it around the world, the representation in this Biennale is significantly higher than what is in the profession itself. Okay. So, um, well, I can imagine some people suggesting that it is just rhetorical to say that you're looking to generate answers together whilst not really letting some voices emerge or, you know... Uh, it could be interpreted as silencing them as well. Uh, I think if you come and see the Biennale, uh, I hope that the projects and the representation speaks for itself. Okay, so tell us what you're trying to achieve with this biennial. With this biennial, we are trying to show that the way we live together uh, needs to be rethought. From the scale of the human body, all the way up to the scale of the planet. It needs to be rethought because we have damaged our planet and we need to fix that. We need to work on that. And if 66% of the carbon emissions uh, come from the built environment, then we do bear a big responsibility towards that. We need to live together because our global commons, the Amazons, the air, the uh, oceans have been gravely affected by the way we have lived separately as nation states. And therefore, we need to think about how we can bridge over those boundaries in order to recreate our global commons. We need to live together better as communities because in our inner cities, 
in the way we live to, together now, we have created very strong boundaries between neighborhoods, between income groups. Uh, we have left a lot of groups out uh, ethnically and otherwise. And therefore, we need to rethink how these groups can come together around public spaces, around uh, mm -hmm. common facilities. We need to live together better in our houses, because even though the family lifestyle and the household composition is no longer the single family with two children and a dog and a car and a suburban house, only 30% of families have that model. But we still work and live as if that is the ideal, that is the goal mm -hmm. for every household. Okay, and Hashim, to sorry to cut you off there. As individual. We sorry. don't have much time left. I'm very sorry to cut you off there because this is all really interesting. And it really leads me uh, to my next question, which is that, I mean, this sounds really good and very optimistic to me. So my question will be, is this, um, I mean, is this a realistic future potential, do you think? All of us living together uh, in the context of widening political gaps and economic instability, uh, or is this some sort of optimistic, wishful thinking? There is a range of propositions in this Biennale, from projects that present the reality as it is and therefore try to accept and deal with this reality, to projects that are trying to implement very specific ways in which we can change some of these conditions realistically in the city. And then there are some that are very visionary, that are not meant to be implemented, but they ask, what if it could be otherwise? Why can't we imagine ourselves to be living idealistically in a very different world? And that's architecture's role and has been architecture's role throughout in uh, exercising a collective imaginary and applying it uh, at different scales. All right, Hashim Sarkis, it was very good to have you with us today. Thank you so much. This year's Venice Architecture Biennial asks, how will we live together in a world of social injustice, political uncertainty, climate change and an ongoing pandemic? And Turkey's pavilion has a proposal. Here's a look. This is Architecture as Measure, the theme for the Turkish Pavilion at the 17th International Architecture Biennial in Venice. The project is inspired by curator Nairan Turan's book of the same name. It's coordinated by the Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts. It positions climate change as a cultural and political idea that requires a renewed architectural, environmental imagination. It seeks to explore how architecture can contribute to the environment beyond just technological dependence. To do this, Architecture as Measure invites people to think about such mundane things as zoning laws and supply chains that can be associated with much larger structural problems and issues. We need to go beyond understanding planetary imagination for architecture as preserving nature, or as technological management, or as mapping, meaning visualization. Instead, the project calls for an imagination that juxtaposes the planetary and the quotidian. What we mean uh, by that is the need to see larger planetary questions and the everyday aspects of architecture's own inner workings, things that are usually thought as being separate, as one and the same thing. Turan says in an exhibition that looks at the relationship between the inner workings of architectural structure and planetary vision, it is important to rethink the exhibition itself. Designed by Nini Studio, this is for dioramas. It consists of four yellow rooms, an abandoned quarry, a warehouse, a care and maintenance facility, and a reconstruction site for Earth's future inhabitants. Each diorama showcases an overall aspect of architecture, such as mineral extraction processes and simple tools such as helmets and rulers. They also display environmental pollution and injustice in the context of climate change. And for an exhibition trying to prompt alternative environmental imaginations of climate change, the diorama is fitting in two ways. 
On the one hand, through the restaging of a familiar model such as the Arama, which is usually used in museums, and messing it with stories and controversies of resource extraction, waste, and environmental injustice in the Anthropocene. Second, by allowing circulation into itself, meaning the visitors can really go into the dioramas themselves, they become part of this living image. The project also features research and stories on its website. The curators and participants update them constantly, which Turan describes as an alternative exhibition catalogue. One of the biggest reasons for this is it will not be possible for everyone to attend. According to Turan, even if there was no pandemic, students might not have been able to afford this experience. That's why the Turkish team launched their website six months ahead of the official opening. So instead of thinking the architectural exhibition as a thing that only focuses on that opening date of the exhibition, we reconceptualized it. We reconceptualized our exhibition project that starts before the opening itself and continues growing over the course of the Biennale and perhaps afterwards. Through installation and storytelling, Architecture as Measure tries to suggest a route where architecture is more active in its relationship with the environment and it highlights the need for it in a world dealing with environmental problems from deforestation to unplanned urbanisation. Turan says this single project won't save the world but she believes it's a powerful first step to encourage rethinking the role of architecture. We begin our shortcuts with a missing Picasso. Police have recovered the painting and two other artworks which were stolen nearly a decade ago from Athens National Gallery. They located the pieces after questioning a Greek builder who confessed to the crimes and directed where to find the artworks near his home. The suspect has been arrested but not yet named. Sotheby's has sold a portrait of David Hockney for over $20 million. Lucien Freud painted the close-up of Hockney's face in 2002. It was later exhibited in Freud's retrospective at the National Portrait Gallery in London. A tower designed by Frank Gehry has opened to the public in the south of France. It's the main attraction at the new creative campus Luma Arles. The tower hosts a library and office space, while the rest of the facility includes exhibition and performance halls. A tattoo artist opened Japan's first ever NFT exhibition in Tokyo. Crypt Tokyo features 150 works of several dozens of artists with screens that show a rotating selection of art. The NFTs can be purchased online with cryptocurrencies for costs ranging from a few hundred dollars to 50,000. And finally, after nearly a year and a half off, the musical Prince of Egypt has returned to London's West End. The musical is an adaptation of the 1998 DreamWorks animation. This show is just one of the few that can afford to reopen with only half of its audience thanks to the size of its auditorium at the Dominion Theatre. For the last three years, TRT has been awarding screenplays at the 12th Puntus Script Days competition. The goal is to create a network between experienced and new filmmakers. I presented the award ceremony and Nursena Tutar talked to some of the winners. Here's more. 12 Punto TRT Script Days brings in young creators into the Turkish film industry. This year's edition was supposed to be all about women although few competed. We want to have more Turkish female filmmakers. Yes, all of the jury members are women, but this year's winners don't have many female creators among them. I believe we'll have more female directors and screenwriters who will participate in the festival next year. So I hope we'll be able to award more women in the future for their work. We encourage more women filmmakers by selecting an all-female jury. One of the winners of the International Co-Production Awards is a film called Men vs. Flock. 
it's, it's based on an event I witnessed in Macedonia, but later it became a fiction story. Uh, and uh, the, the core of the story is a uh, uh, conflict between uh, the modern world and the traditional world. And it's uh, based on a, a female character who has lived her, spent her life uh, living like uh, ex expectations uh, to take over the man's role. But uh, she ran away from that and uh, after many years uh, she has to deal with the consequences of uh, uh, facing her past. Another film with a prominent female lead, The Sun, The Moon and The Eleven Stars has won the pre -buy Award. This project is about two strong women. One of them is called Julie, a Christian Arab who was born in France. Her father is from Mardin, Turkey. When the father dies, Julie realizes that she has an aunt. This family secret becomes a burden on her. Even though these two women don't fully speak each other's languages, they become friends. In the midst of family feuds and a war in Syria, Julie tries to fulfill her aunt's last wish. The night ended with filmmakers and the jury hoping for a world where they don't have to fight so hard for gender equality anymore. Nur Sanat Tar TRT World Istanbul. Citizen Kane made Orson Welles a legend, but it was the stranger that gave him his Hollywood comeback. We open up our movie almanac to 75 years ago and see why critics say this film revealed another side of the director. Franz. It's high Franz. Heineke, we mustn't be seen talking together. Orson Welles may have nabbed nine Oscar nominations for Citizen Kane, but in 1942 he was a Hollywood director in exile. A documentary he was producing Hello, fell apart. Hello, At the same time, his The Magnificent Ambersons was taken away from him while it was in post-production. So Wells became a speechwriter for Franklin Roosevelt. But by 1945, the studios wanted him back. The offer? The Stranger. A story about intrigue, in a comeback story for Wells. The must be destroyed. I wish to know the whereabouts of Franz Kindler. The film uses a straightforward narrative, and it has a high-concept premise. United Nations War Crimes Commission Officer Wilson tracks down a fugitive Nazi officer. The war criminal is now living under a false identity. As Charles Rankin, he has become a teacher in a New England town. Wilson tries to prove to Rankin's wife, the daughter of a Supreme Court official, that he's not who he claims to be. Wells would later tell interviewer Peter Bogdanovich that he was alarmed by the increase in Nazi sympathizers after the war, and both politically and emotionally felt obliged to do the picture. Instead of his Mercury Theatre regulars, Wells had to work with star Edward G. Robinson as the main lead, and chose to assume the role of the ex-Nazi himself. Loretta Young played his on-screen wife. Wells recalled how producers would try to interfere with his camera angles on set. They would insist on close-ups of the stars for audience appeal. And Wells would then need to explain to his actors how unnecessary shots of that kind would hurt the picture's aesthetic. For the overall look of the movie, Wells donned a film noir-inspired visual style and complemented that with real footage shot at Nazi concentration camps. The Stranger is the first commercial film to use such material. Wells explained that he didn't include the camps for exploitation, however. He only wanted to remind viewers the horrors that that happened. Audiences responded well to the film, so much so that it became Orson Welles's only major box office hit. The critics wrote that his unique visual style was appealing, and scholars announced that Wells found a niche in the noir canon. Variety praised it in length, and pointed out that the script, the cast, 
and the film's web of thrills made it a crowd pleaser. In the end, with The Stranger's success, Wells finally proved to the media and film executives that he was not just a Hollywood outlaw. He could produce good results within the studio system as well. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Thank you.